Well, welcome everyone. We're excited for the STEM showcase on Makerspaces, and we're super excited to have uh, Kevin Larkin here from the Catalyst Arts and Makerspace in the Tucson Mall because it's so cool and unique and different. Uh, but again, before we get to that, I just want to reiterate what Corey said about the STEM Leadership Cadre, a group of us that are just trying to highlight best practices and um, model programs and things that are going on in STEM so that we can all learn from each other. Uh, and so we're happy that you're here and we hope that we'll see you uh, next quarter when we get to see again a uh, showcase from uh, Paradise Valley. So join us and stay connected. Always you can check back on that page from GCU to um, see what's going on and what's coming up next. With that, I just want to thank Sherry Dennis, my partner in crime on this amazing side, who was out taking photos of some makerspaces today as we do hope in the future that these will be hybrid events where you'll be able to, some folks that are local to wherever we're highlighting a space in Arizona will be able to be in that space. And then also others will be able to join virtually. But given the crazy nature of everything still, we just decided to keep this one fully virtual. And also we had to shift around uh, times and dates a little bit here at the last moment. And so, we are grateful that everyone's been flexible. I feel like we're all, we're all contortionists, not by choice at this point, but very flexible because we have to be. So with that, um, I'd also love to thank Kevin Larkin, who is super flexible and is currently helping someone in their space record. So he's going to join us for his bit and then have to take off. But obviously, we will help you connect with him. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in seeing that space in person, he will certainly tell you how you can do that as well. So with that, Kevin, I'm going to let you take over and uh, tell us about this awesome, interesting, cool space inside of the Tucson Mall. Thank you, Danelle. Um, and thanks, Corey and Sherry. Nice to see you. <clears throat> um, like Danelle said, my name is Kevin Larkin. I'm the program coordinator at the Catalyst Arts and Makerspace. We are run by a nonprofit called the Southern Arizona Arts and Cultural Alliance, which is SACA. Some of you might be familiar with SACA through many of our um, events out in the community. We do fine art festivals and culinary events. Some of our best known ones are Savor with the Botanic Gardens. We do the Patagonia Fall Fest, which is now called the Sky Island um, Art Market. We do the Oro Valley Art Festival. And so Saka um, has a long history of putting on art festivals and um, culinary festivals. And this is a relatively new venture for us um, being a nonprofit organization that does event planning. We now have our own space. So I'm sitting in one of the offices here, um, which was actually a community mural project done by a, a high school teacher in Amphi. And so this whole space was kind of meant to be a community uh, gathering place, maker space, education space. So um, before I get on with the tour, um, I'll just let you know that we opened December 1st, around December 1st, 2019. We were here for six months. Things were awesome. We got to see Danelle and Sherry a whole lot with this amazing project in here, and then everything shut down. So we are on the rebuild right now. Um, currently we have, uh, right now as I'm speaking, we have a Tucson Youth Music Center who's a, um, they give music lessons to children that can't afford music lessons. So any elementary school teachers out there on the call afterwards that uh, are involved with music, please um, send them my way. And uh, we also have a Red Herring Puppets soundtrack recording going on, um, which I'm engineering. So it's a really fun project. And let me just pull up the, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. I'll give you a brief overview of the space before I take you on the tour. Uh, let's see. Um, hang on, sorry about that. And while Kevin is sharing his screen, um, if you haven't already popped in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're from. And one um, great thing you can put in the chat is what you are looking to get out of this STEM leadership cadre. Obviously, you're going to get some awesome makerspace resource tonight, but 
we have a slew of individuals that have or that are so well connected in the stem ecosystem if you're looking for something in particular special i mean you're here talking to us so pop that into the chat for us and we'd be happy to help out did i buy you enough time kevin yeah yep it's i can down, i can talk for hours my, my friend being a little weird but yeah i'm going to share my screen here and okay here it is Okay, as I do this, I'm going to walk out into the main space so you can kind of get a look. So what you're looking at right now is the um, main mall doors. So like Danelle said, it's a very unconventional space being located within the Tucson Mall. So as you can see, you have Sears and the food court is down there. For those of you familiar with the Tucson Mall, um, it's closest to the old Red Robin, which is right down this hallway. And so from the outside, um, you can kind of see these doors. We have some digital displays. And this is our main gathering area. And OK, there's my screen share. OK, can everyone see that? Looks great, Kevin. Okay, now we got it running. So this is a brief overview of kind of what has happened at Catalyst and what the original vision was and how it's kind of changed um, as, as we've uh, dealt with the pandemic. So Catalyst is a first of its kind innovative space where culture, collaboration, and community intersect. The SACA tagline and kind of our mission is um, uh, let's see, is uh, Art Inspires and Culture Unites. So this whole space is meant to be very inspiring. So it has tons of local art throughout the space. It's 14,000 square feet of flexible learning, performance, gathering, and maker spaces. Um, we have classes, meetings, private event rentals, performance venue, uh, kind of some of our own unique programming through SACA and co-working offices. So here's just some pictures of that. We have performance and venue, we've had some dance. Uh, Arizona Tech Council held their um, monthly meeting here, painting classes, lifestyle classes, kids camps. So this is kind of a general overview of the space from a bird's eye view. Um, I'm standing in that big room, the communal gathering space, we call it the main floor. We have four different rooms, a robotics and engineering lab, a arts and crafts studio, a community room, education room, culinary space, a music and film lab, and a big co-working space in the back. Um, here's kind of a, a few shots of what those spaces can turn into. So as you can see on the main event floor, we've had presentations, podcasts, performances, that kind of thing. It can hold about 250 people seated. Um, the teaching kitchen, we've held uh, lots of teaching uh, classes there, uh, cooking classes, as well as a nice space for catering for events. A robotics lab, which I'll show you in a minute, um, is actually being currently being rented by a business called Art Mixer that um, specializes in group painting projects. And then the other spaces are pretty flexible with what they do. Um, like I said, the Music and Digital Arts Lab also doubles as a performance space. So um, that's just some of the specs. We we have really good internet here, so. Uh, for live streaming events, it's worked pretty well in COVID with hybrid events. Um, we've multiple streamed, or I want to say like seven orchestral events here in concerts. Um, every mural you see in the space was painted by a local artist. So some of our partnerships that I'd like to highlight um, through kind of what you can expect in Catalyst and just what we've learned and who we've partnered with uh, has taken us to a lot of places I wouldn't think a makerspace would have ever gone. Um, right now we are currently the rehearsal space for the Southern Arizona Symphony Orchestra, the Tucson Repertory Orchestra. So they rehearse here at least a few times a month in this main room I'm standing in. 
We've worked with AARP to do music classes and film classes. Ameren Foundation held um, kind of a satellite teaching location where they would bring in pottery, <coughs> kind of um, do a whole, they had a whole program of classes right when we opened. Subspace is a uh, local art collective and we've partnered with them to do sustainable gift wrapping around the holidays. Natural Grocers currently teaches classes here about once a month. Um, for corporate arts experiences outside of nonprofits, we have worked with Roche Tissue, Tissue Diagnostics to do, basically it was a uh, training for high school students to learn what it was like to follow a cell from its biopsy all the way to its analysis. So um, it was called the journey of a cell and it was really cool because we ended up using all of the different rooms as a different part of the journey. So, you know, one was dyeing, dyeing the tissue for the slides. Um, one room was just the biopsy room and that was in the kitchen. So um, just to kind of give you a, a, an overview of what can be done, the ideal, the ideal things that happen in Catalyst kind of connect all the different experiences. Um, we've worked with the Tucson Regional Educator Collaborative to hold their annual workshop and meeting. Um, Pima Federal Credit Union, we kind of had a creative corporate annual uh, meeting. And then like I said, with the, with the robotics lab, it's being currently rented by a small business. So we also have a small business that rents the arts and crafts studio that does Mexican paper flower art. Um, as far as arts and crafts uh, groups that we partner with, Sonoran Glass, Bookman's, Lucky Cat Social, Angela Hit Designs is the teacher at Ampi that helped us curate the murals with students, Scratchboard University. Uh, we've done numerous film screenings here with Independent Film Arizona, writing workshops, Tucson Aspiring Filmmakers. We're actually partnering with the Arizona International Film Fest um, to host Sesame Street producers here in Catalyst in a, in a month. Uh, cooking, we have a, a bunch of great local businesses that have done classes in here. Likewise with Lifestyle, we did uh, Harry Potter Alliance, which specializes in teaching children um, social justice conversations. Had monthly workshops in here for free. We had yoga classes and we have uh, currently ABC Guidance does career counseling for students. Here's some of our highlighted partners through the years. This is kind of what the space can look like when it's full of people for um, kind of like a sit down conference style seating. So this event was about 150 people. This is a photo from the AARP drum circle. It's a really fun day. Photo from the Ameren Foundation. This is Art Mixer currently teaching in the robotics lab doing a group paint project, a cooking class. This is the Southern Arizona Symphony Orchestra during one of their rehearsals. Um, as far as STEM education in particular, uh, STEMazing obviously is one of been, uh, our very big highlights. We had uh, some great workshops with them. Sherry's been here a lot teaching uh, robotics to teachers. One of our great partnerships right now we're doing as I speak is the Tucson Youth Music Center. Like I said, there's free music lessons for Tucson's underserved youth. We offer it three days a week. Um, students are given instruments if they don't have them, and it's been a pretty successful program. They've been around for about 50 years in Tucson, and they just lost their building space, so we're serving as an area for them to teach. Um, we've done the Inner Voice, uh, which is a local business that does voice lessons. We did their summer camps for youth. Um, we're currently working with Red Herring Puppets to produce their soundtrack for a show and um, we host the American String Teachers Association for their uh, uh, annual exams for students. So here's some pictures from those partnerships. That's the Tucson Youth Music Center on the left and the Inner Voice Camp on the right. Robotics and Engineering, we've had uh, Coder Dojo, which did monthly free meetups for uh, kids learning coding. We've also had uh, Zero Craft was an initial partner on our robotics lab, um, and we're still trying. We're still recovering from the pandemic, and hope to work with them again. And it's an amazing project. Obviously, uh, you guys have been in here a lot. Here's some highlight pictures from those. 
Uh, we also have a co-working space in the back um, that's kind of open to anyone. Uh, right now we have an architecture firm that is uh, renting its Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture. Uh, on Media, who prints a lot of the programs for theater, Bill's Around Town is back there. Music producer, a muralist, so there's a lot that can happen in here. And I'll give you guys a quick tour. Does anyone have any questions before I uh, go on with the tour? I haven't seen any in the chat. If folks have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask Kevin as he's uh, taking us around the space. Yeah, and I'll do a Q&A after, but for now, uh, hey, Charles, um, I'll kind of show you around. So this is the main floor. Like I said, I can hold about 250 uh, people seated. And then the robotics lab. It's been around. I'm just curious. What was that? How long, like, how long has this been open? Like, I didn't even know. <laughs> I, know. I didn't even know it existed. I'm like in shock right now. Like this is, I literally live down the street from the Tucson mall. So I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, uh, let me open this room real quick for Charles. We have a music teacher that needs to get into the room. So I'll show you this room and then I will answer your question. So this is the arts and crafts room. Um, these great murals of Basquiat and Frida on the wall. So there's Charles, one of our Tucson Youth Music Center teachers <laughs> doing saxophone lessons in here. This room is actually, this weekend is going to be a sewing workshop um, for just open to the public, put on by the, I think, Southern Arizona Quilters Association. Um, but we were, we opened in, the initial planning for this began back in 2017. It took a couple years to um, plan and do the build out, and it was essentially a partnership between Saka and Brookfield Properties, who owns the Tucson Mall. So Saka's old office space is at the other end of the mall, and this is where the gap used to be. So the, sto the mall had a lot of stores closing and wanted something to do with it, you know, to, to have more community buy-in, I think, is honestly the... You know, big box stores coming and going. They wanted something that would be kind of like a pillar that people could come to um, for the community. And so we partnered with them. Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture students designed the space. And um, the Brookfield Properties helped pay for the build out. And so when it was all said and done, when we launched uh, in late November of 2019, so, um, and at that point we had first Fridays, we had second Saturday art markets. It was every day of the week we had something going on. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a very brief window, which is probably why you didn't hear of it. Um, and, you know, also people are just going to malls less. So, you know, that's one thing when you walk around this mall, it is changing. We have Red Herring Puppets who is doing their soundtrack today, it actually has a space at the other end of the mall. There's a mystery escape room. There's games and gadgets. There's a lot of local businesses that, are, that have moved in and are taking advantage of, honestly, the cheap rent and the accessibility. It's for holding STEM events and any kind of education events. It's an ideal education space. Uh, I will show you the Kevin. next part. Kevin, quick part? question from, oh, yeah. uh, from the chat. People are wondering, uh, is it going to be coming to Phoenix or Mesa? And I know at some point they're the, the company that helped you does own malls around the country, right? So can you speak a little bit about how this is a model space that could potentially yeah. be used to replicate around the country? Yeah, there's a few, there are, there are people trying a few things like this, not per, exactly like Catalyst, but community spaces and malls. Um, Brookfield Properties owns, I don't know how many malls, a lot of malls across the country. This is definitely, we're definitely one of a, like a pilot project for them. So we have a long lease on the space um, to, because you know it, you can't figure something like this out in a couple years. It really is an experiment in you know in retail because it's it's uh, not meant for that. It's meant to be a creative space, but at the same time, it draws in you know we've drawn in two businesses of local artists. It employs a lot of artists. It employs a lot of teachers. Students have access to the space. So um, Saka currently. It, this is the only one that we are managing. So this was a very new venture for Saka in particular. There was initial conversations before the pandemic about, you know, about doing something like this in another place. And I have no doubt that as it grows um, and staff grows and, you know, the vision grows that something like that is possible. 
Um, right now, we're very much in COVID recovery mode, so um, we're trying to keep this space, you know, strong and going. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it is a little bit different, and, you know, the, the general people that come to the malls aren't usually looking for a, an immersive arts experience or, uh, you know, a painting class or a cooking class or STEM class, but it's, it's really cool to see people walk through the mall and pop in and start asking questions because a lot of times what draws them in is there's a symphony playing or there's a cooking class or a dance troupe practicing so um yeah it's it, ideally yes it would be replicated in other places and we see this very much as kind of leading the charge in that way and <clears throat> trying to find out what works like honestly even with doing the, our businesses in the robotics lab that was something new that we kind of had to do use as a solution for COVID, right? No students were allowed to basically go. Uh, a lot of teachers were pretty strapped with their own curriculums and everything. And so we had a business that wanted to come in, have a storefront window, and it's drawn so many people into the space and they've gotten involved in other projects and cooking classes and, you know, so uh, the cool thing about this is the foot traffic that, draw, that draws people in that wouldn't otherwise have been drawn in. Um, Another nice thing is that there's four bathrooms, so it's any event you have. And some of us were commenting in the chat about how cool each bathroom is, but don't show people because they need to come to see them. Okay, I won't, I won't spill that. It's the best art. But this is the, uh, the Bookman's wall. So Bookman's outfits this wall, like, you know, grab collage, grab a magazine, start collaging. Um, let's see, this is the community room, which is a multi-use room. Right now there's a guitar lesson happening in there with Tucson Youth Music Center. <laughs> um, we had two BNI groups meeting in there this morning, and we have a fundraiser there this weekend in that room. And then we'll take a look inside the kitchen. Kevin, as you're walking around, um, the a question, do you, if I have a, if I want to teach guitar and I, can I just come in and, and contract with you? Or do you take uh, educational institutions before you take random Joe Schmoes or Corey Schmoes as in yeah. my case? Great question. Yeah. So generally, so right now, um, Catalyst is still considered open for private bookings. So we, in the past, before the pandemic, we would have a lot more public events because we're kind of strapped and we're kind of trying to figure out what really works. Um, with a partner like the Tucson Youth Music Center, we um, had initial conversations about serving as an external home for them, a temporary home for them, which has worked out really well. However, anyone can come in and rent the space and teach a class. Usually, you know, SACA will do some sort of vetting, um, you know, generally we'll have people send us their websites, their teaching experience. We'll kind of do a, a crash course in how the, everything works as far as ticketing goes and marketing and stuff like that. Our cooking classes have been very popular for people that just, you know, have had a passion that maybe have had experience in restaurants or had their own business at some point, but just wanted to teach a class. So, and it's actually helped build a couple businesses through that. But we have, it's more common for, um, businesses or professional teaching artists to, to rent the space, I'd say. Um, and, you know, some are, some are very, it kind of blurs the line. Like we have some artists that would participate in soccer events at the fine art festivals that always had an educational component to their art that said, hey, I want to teach a class in Catalyst. And so we tried that out. And so there, it really is, you know, a, a big varying spectrum, but generally speaking, if you're an experienced teacher, it's going to work better. And also, if you have a following, it's going to work better because while Saka does have a pretty big reach with the history of the organization, um, it, it, my experience is if the teacher can bring about 70% of the class, Saka can bump that extra 30%. And that's when teachers approach about teaching, I'll do a teacher orientation, kind of go through what they can expect. And sometimes that turns them off, sometimes it turns them on to, you know, for instance, they have to provide all their own ticketing right now and event management. So when someone signs up, we, we don't have the capacity right now to do all the ticketing for all the classes. So, um, but the good side with that is it's a very affordable room rate. They started about $40 an hour. 
um, for room rentals and um, you can really do whatever you want with any room. So the teaching kitchen right now, for instance, temporarily is going to be a paper flower workshop. Oh, that's These awesome. All <laughs> paper flowers from one of the businesses that rents in here and she's going to be storefront, uh, mall, mall front this weekend doing paper flower workshops. So yeah, this is a commercial kitchen. We've got a refrigerator and freezer and a commercial oven. Unfortunately, with the ventilation requirements, we couldn't do a um, grease open fire, you know, open fire cooking. So I'm gas open fire cooking, but it's pretty flexible and we've had a lot of success with the teaching kitchen. And I know I'm almost out of time for the tour, so I'll quickly show you the, uh, the media lab and the co-working spaces. And if anyone has any questions after the Q&A or is interested in renting the space, please, um, I'm putting my email in the chat right now. And while you're doing that, Kevin, I'll just say from this amazing perspective, it's just a beautiful space to be able to spoil teachers in and make them feel, I mean, you just, it's beautiful and you feel valued and uh, ready and excited to learn in such a beautiful space. So we love it there. Yeah, thank you, Danelle, for saying that. It is a really colorful space, um, and it, de it definitely brings out people's imaginations. This is the, the music lab where we're doing the soundtrack to, this is Lisa Sturge with Red Herring Puppets. All you teachers out there, quick plug, if you're looking for STEM puppet shows, Lisa has many STEM puppet shows. She's been a professional puppeteer for over 45, 45 years. years, worked with Jim Henson, George Lucas, no big deal. Um, I put her link in the chat. I put the link to her website in the chat. Oh, yep. thank you. So, and this is Joshua Hayes with ABC Guidance. Hello, hello. This is thank the, uh, he runs a basically career counseling um, for students. Yep. And you just moved here from California. So this is the fun part about Catalyst. You get to walk around and there's all sorts of people. The last little part I'll show you is the Co-working space, we actually do still have a couple offices that are open for rent. Kevin, quick question. Um, in terms of some of the spaces, like the robotics lab doesn't have tools or anything in it, but like um, the recording studio and things like that, are there cases where people have to have some training to rent spaces or the kitchen or do you vet them? Yeah, good question. No, the, um, we have limited, we do have limited gear. Um, the, the rooms are kind of, thought of more like blank slates where the teacher would bring in the equipment. However, um, in the, and, and ideally that could change, you know, if we get a big donation of 3D printers, we would of course put them in here and have them be educational and do the maintenance and the upkeep, which is kind of what we're doing with the music lab. So we have a selection of microphones, a production computer, a grand piano that's on loan from the Tucson Youth Music Center. And so, yes, those are all like, um, I'd say add-ons. Usually you'll, you'd hire a soccer engineer like myself or you would get trained on the equipment to use it. Um, but generally speaking, it's pretty bare bones right now. I hope that continues to, you know, evolve and that we could serve as more of that. And, you know, with, the, I, with calling Catalyst a makerspace, the initial vision was very much an educational makerspace like that. And of course, when COVID hit, it really did have an impact on what that meant to be a makerspace. So people call asking like, can I sign up? Can I, you know, do this or that? And it's, you know, we're zero craft. You go and you work on your project. You have your own little cubby. This is more like an educational makerspace. So it's, you know, teaching um, it, very clean power, good internet, good lighting, you know. Uh, so that's what I think would, kind of differentiates it between it. And it's, you know, so it's kind of evolved almost more into a community education slash event space. Um, so the makerspace element of things is is still working. Like even with this music session today, we're, we're experimenting with that. Like how does it look like for us to, you know, as an organization run a production for a puppet company, um, running the microphones, doing the production. And we've, we've experimented that with the AV on live stream concerts, hybrid events. We've done uh, hybrid events with Tucson Regional Educators, where we had, we piped in the um, Secretary of State, I mean, the Secretary of Education from the state on the big screen. So it's, it's you know, a hybrid event space, but we could also teach that technology. So we, we definitely look towards partners to make everything happen in Catalyst. 
We're a staff of five that runs 20 events throughout the year in this whole space. So um, just to give a little context, I wear 30 hats walking around Catalyst. So we rely on partners like Tucson Youth Music Center, it's just amazing to bring in awesome programming that we can help bring to the community. Uh, we have Kevin for about five more minutes. And so uh, let's take advantage of him. What questions do you all have? You can either put them in the chat or feel free to unmute and answer or ask them to him directly. Um, there was a question in the chat about field trips. So there was a question about that. And we had done something with some students at one point, right? So uh, what's the field trip status? Yeah, um, we have hosted field trips here before and we are currently looking to partner with organizations for the AZ on track initiative that was just announced. Um, through the governor's office, it's we, we have toyed with um, and we've, we've been in contact with uh, many of the school districts to try to do something here. Um, and I was emailing Danelle about this just before today, but we, we have some great partner organizations that are that have a great track record of summer camps. So while SACA would not have the teachers do the summer camps, we would, again, partner with an organization, Tucson Youth Music Center. We're going to be doing summer camps. We have an artist summer camp coming this summer. So our website, uh, uh, SACA.org, you go under the Catalyst tab. We're going to be announcing those soon. But we're also actively this week and next week trying to get funding to host summer camps. So if you are a teacher or know a teacher that needs an education space um, and through that program you know transportation and meals are covered and subsidized so you know or if you wanted to host a field trip with your class to catalyst and have a partner like red herring puppets teach you how to make puppets or you know something like that please reach out because we're always uh, we haven't worked with enough schools we want to work with more schools we're getting more and more students every day with the music center um, with we had used to host Make Way for Books. Um, I'm in talks with Literacy Connects and Stories That Soar to do something here. So we're really trying to be active as as a field trip destination. So please get in touch if any teachers out there are looking for field trip destinations, have ideas for summer camps, and need a space. Um, yeah, please reach out. Kevin, another question was: In order to sign up as a student, do they have to pay a fee? And I think Ruth, that was in reference to the music students, uh, but you can clarify if you want. Yeah, so it depends on the summer camp. With Tucson Youth Music Center, there's no fee for any of the students. With that partner, their whole mission is to give students free music education. Um, for the summer, for one of the summer camps we're hosting with Angela Hit Designs, there is a fee. So I think it's $200 for the week. Um, so it really depends on who the partner is that's hosting the summer camp. With, uh, with funding that we're you know, actively trying to secure from say it's uh, AZ on track funding or back on track funding, ideally SACA would be able to play a little bit of the camp facilitator. We wouldn't teach, but the funding could come to host the camp for free for students, get the teachers paid, but um, you know, that's all really dependent on what partners work with the applications and you know, and in the future, I think we would find a stable partner that, you know, we could have transportation and meals covered. And we've been in talks with school districts as well to try to make that happen. Um, it's just, you know, the first step of, of getting one under our belt. And Jacqueline's question is, what about teacher in-service workshops for learning about the different offerings and our ideas for school site maker spaces? And maybe I can take that that's, one. That's you. <laughs> uh, um, so I think we can uh, answer some of those questions in the next part. So that kind of cues us up for that. So hold that thought, uh, Jacqueline. Um, and then any other questions for Kevin while we still have him? And I'm just putting in the chat a link to the rental page. And this is, like I said, for if you wanted to rent, rent a classroom, just kind of basic rental rates to hold workshops. And then there is... Uh, our upcoming classes and events, which is changing every day. Um, and, you know, in working with Stamazing and any teacher organizations, we really try to do make it as affordable a space to rent as possible, but also we are always try to get funding to hold events for free to be able to do this stuff as a community space. 
Yeah. And Annette, one of our teacher leaders is here. She's been in your space. And so she's talking about how awesome it is in the chat. Oh, can, yeah, we thanks, thank, <laughs> can we thank Kevin uh, for his time and also being flexible and also this beautiful tour of your beautiful space. Thank you so much, Danelle and Sherry and Corey. Um, yeah, what an honor to present for you all. Thank you for being great educators out there. And if you ever want to come by and take a tour in person, just drop me a, an email and uh, I'm here most days during the week. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. We'll see you soon. Sounds Thanks, good. Kevin. Can't wait to get down there. All right. And so next up, we are going to uh, talk about the elementary school maker space side of things. So I think this will get to um, Jacqueline's uh, question about maker spaces. Uh, and um, again, for those who don't know me, I'm director of this amazing project here at the Pima County School Superintendent's Office. Um, let me just share my screen. If you're playing Zoom bingo, you can mark off narrating navigation. Uh, that's a joke. You don't have a bingo card. We didn't send those out. Um, <laughs> I'm good. That's, it's good to see some people laugh. Uh, it's just are so we now. Still? Now are we awake still? Okay, good. I want to play. Uh, I want to play. <laughs> uh, and so um, Sherry, Dennis, and I have been working on lots of different projects together and um, some of those have included helping uh, local elementary schools put in maker spaces. And we, from that experience now, have some expertise, always growing expertise on lots of different things. But we're going to share um, the Oyama maker space with you today. So Oyama Elementary School is part of Tucson Unified School District. Uh, we also have maker spaces going into Carrillo Elementary School. Uh, um, Warren Elementary School like snuck into our Oyama professional development and then got the same stuff that Oyama had from our kit list. And so, you know, smart principals, smart teachers, like what's going on? We want to do that too. Uh, and then we have our eye on a couple of other um, local elementary schools that we hope to build space out in. Um, the funding for these projects have come from a variety of sources as is always the case. Um, uh, in in one case, um, oh, am I sharing the wrong screen? Did I share my screen? Is it? Can you see this? You did. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, and so, uh, in one case, uh, Oyama was able to fund a lot of their initial investment in their makerspace equipment and supplies with STEM CAN grants. Uh, as those of you who know that are in Southern Arizona, we had an amazing champion for STEM education, Dr. Steve, who unfortunately passed away. Uh, just a couple of years ago, and now that um, funding source isn't there anymore. You will find that our makerspace um, suggestion kits are are scaled to six hundred dollars because his grants were six hundred dollars, and so we made them so that teachers could take that and then ask for the funding, and then it's all ready to go. Right. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how we would change those if that wasn't kind of the limit for the funding. Um, but we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, other funding has come from school districts or principals finding their own funding for supplies. So that was the case with Warren Elementary. Uh, and then in some other cases, we have funders, uh, whether that's Tucson Electric Power or Raytheon uh, or others that are interested in supporting maker spaces and work with us over the years and are supporting some of these spaces as well. So it's a hustle and we're hustling. <laughs> Uh, and so um, Sherry went over just today and took um, updated photos of the um, makerspace at Oyama. Um, and Sherry, tell us about that dragon. Oh, that is one of my favorite dragons. I believe a parent might have made it. It's all metal and it's, I would love to learn how to weld. Um, it's, uh, I would say it's at least six feet tall. And what do you think about, uh, maybe six feet wide? Yeah. Uh, and Uyama is mascot is the dragon. So we call them the, um, the maker, the maker dragons. Maker dragons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And then Sherry, <laughs> Sherry loves robots. So of course she had to take a picture of the robot, but what you're seeing here is a cardboard space. And so making with cardboard is amazing, right? And that is a really great place to start if you want to start super on the cheap and, and start doing things. 
uh, with making. And I'm actually heading out to San Fernando uh, next week to go work with all the students out in rural Pima County on um, building with cardboard. And if you haven't seen Kane's Arcade, my gosh, you should watch that. We don't have time for it here. But um, a and lot of these resources, as I'm like whittling through these and you're frantically trying to write things down, we won't right. be putting the links in the chat because it's already linked on our collection on our website. So don't worry about writing stuff down. I promise you this is in the, just enjoy the awesome space that we're going to tour via Sherry's uh, pictures. And yeah, I think sure. it's awesome that, uh, I don't know if you can tell from that picture, but I, I do believe all the kids, they had separate canvases and those canvases have each piece to make that robot. So nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we love, 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 love amazing picture books. And between Sherry and I, <laughs> we have a wildly large collection of these. Um, we're, these are some of our favorites. If you look on our website, we have a whole collection of uh, amazing picture books, thanks to an intern of mine who entered about a hundred of them uh, on our website. But we, there are all manner that you can really um, get into. And if you haven't gotten the newest Andrea Beatty book, Erin Slater, illustrator. Ooh, every time I think that she's not gonna have a, a book that's better than the last, and every time it's better. Yeah. It's, it's so good. So you got to get that whole series of books is amazing. Um, and of course, here we're seeing Legos and things like that. Sherry, on this shelf, what's your favorite out of those ones that are there? I think the upside down book, "Be a Maker," um, is poems um, about being a maker. And one time we uh, did a PD, and you had to have your favorite STEM song or favorite STEM poem. So we all shared our favorite STEM poems. And I can tell you, the Denells <laughs> was a poem called "Mess," and those of you who've been in my office would understand why. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, that's great. So one thing that's critical, obviously, in a makerspace is organization. Uh, and so you can see that, uh, and, and we'll say first and foremost, a dedicated space for your makerspace is first and foremost critical. So we, we really um, won't work with an elementary school that doesn't, hasn't dedicated a room to their makerspace. Otherwise, we just don't see it being very successful. So um, both Warren and Oyama are building those spaces out and adding and shelving. Uh, and then labeling things is critically important as well. Um, and just keeping track of where they are. And of course, having a person who's dedicated to this job of tracking the materials and supplies, that is critical. And when you are seeking grant funding, you might also try to add that into your request, right? Some stipend for the person that is doing this work because it is not an insignificant amount of time to do that, obviously. And I will and then, tell you that, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. Uh, that uh, Oyama is next year, that's what they're doing. They're actually uh, setting aside some money so that they can hire someone to stock the shelves, make sure everything is uh, in its place and provide maybe some challenges for different students to use. So awesome. Yeah, and Manny, your question about integrating into libraries, also very effective. I will say our Pima County libraries do amazing things across the board, but also with makerspaces. And then the University of Arizona also, and oddly, has a makerspace. It's called Catalyst in their library. Um, that's very good. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so we do see them in different spaces. So when I say that they need to have a dedicated space, it could be a shared space like in a library, but you just have to have some space and room for that. And then also having a system where teachers can effectively and efficiently reserve that space and get know that they're gonna get it in time to really know that they can utilize it is important. Yes, there's lots of catalysts down here in Southern Arizona. Um, uh, we, I just learned today and Sherry did that uh, Oyama also has a kiln that it looks like they need to utilize a bit more. So we look forward to connecting them with some local um, uh, potters and stuff so they can get that into better use. Um, but you can again see just organization here and the different genre of things that they have and the labeling on their um, shelf, their cabinets, which is critically important. Sherry, tell us how much you love these tables. My goodness, the tables are wonderful because they have tiles on them. So, you know, cleanup is pretty easy. I thought it was genius that they had those little markers 
hanging on the edge. And then uh, they put a piece of paper in there so they can draw out their plans. Love the little uh, scoops so they can scoop up all their work. Um, they are looking to replace, they got the, um, the chairs for free um, at a junior high but the chairs, they can't uh, adjust them. So they're looking at putting in some new chairs to make it a little bit more comfortable. Uh, all on wheels. Um, there are, I believe, at least 10 tables. So uh, on wheels, able to move around. They have a wet space in, in the front. Um, it, the more I visited there, I didn't want to leave. I just wanted to play. Yeah, and I will say too, I mean, if you are interested in in visiting the space, um, you know, you can reach out to the principal at Oyama or um, the, just reach out to them in general. And I'm sure that they would welcome you in as long as you schedule that in advance, obviously. Uh, and and um, I will say too, you know, some folks are commenting on how clean it is. It hasn't been utilized as much because of the pandemic, right? So, I mean, they also fell into that. They were putting it together right as this was. And so, I mean, I think it will get more use and be a little bit more obviously uh, utilized. <laughs> I will be using it uh, next week for robotics uh, with about 15 kids. So right now they have a few uh, students in there, but only about 15 at a time. Yeah, and then, you know, the other critical piece is uh, professional development for the teachers. So one of the parts of this that has been great is with funding from Raytheon, we were able to provide professional development to Oyama and Warren, and now uh, we'll be starting with some of the other elementary schools, but um, that's critical, right? You can have all this stuff, but if you don't, haven't used it and teachers haven't gotten their hands on it. So you know, as an example, we did a workshop that was focused on circuits. And so then it was like paper circuits, squishy circuits, and snap circuits. And everybody got to rotate stations. And then some of the teachers were like, you know what, I'm pre-K pre kinder. My students are never going to do paper circuits. And we're like, yeah, we agree with you. But now you've had your hands on them and you know that those probably aren't the ones for your students, but maybe they'll do the squishy circuits. And so carving out that time and providing professional development for teachers so that they can do that is really important. And what's nice about having a group of elementary schools that are kind of building maker spaces with us is that they're going to have basically mirrored supplies. And so then when we provide that professional development, it's easier for them to see how they can use it. Um, and so that's really important. And Edison stuff, we always love this. This was talk about this obstacle course, Sherry. So the obstacle course is, uh, is terrific because basically you have different textures, different uh, areas, and trying to uh, get them uh, to program it to where it will either go around the course using a remote, not as easy as you might think, not because as easy. it's pretty fast. Uh, and then the, the smaller pictures, of course, we had a challenge, an engineering challenge, pick up your bits. The lots of little hole punches and we used uh, that roller tape that you use for lint rollers and gave them the challenge of how can you pick up the bits. And that so, was inspired by the book House of Robots by James Patterson. So Sherry has a whole slew of lessons inspired by the wild robot, but then we've started using House of Robots for fifth grade um, and getting some uh, some challenges that are coming out of that. Um, and then finally, this is our list of um, kind of essential things that we've learned or advice that that uh, the principals and teachers at some of the makerspace schools that we're with have shared. But most of it, I think we've covered. Um, you know, again, the other thing that I would add is that having classroom sets, obviously, of supplies and equipment is also critical. So if you're going to use your makerspace as like after school club space, that's fine, you could have smaller amounts of equipment. But if you want to make it really usable, then you need 15 snap circuit kits so that you can pair up students and let them use them. You need at least 15, 16 Edison robots so that again, you can pair kids up. 32 is better, right? But like, again, as you're building, those are the things to really consider. And then also we have put into the maker spaces science uh, collection equipment, so beakers and scales and things like this. 
We've also put in lots of STEM on the cheap building materials for hacking games and then students inventing and creating prototypes and things like that. So things that they would use to model inventions or whatever they're working on and on and on. So I think all of that plays into this. Sherry, is there anything else from that? I think we have covered that, but but wait, wait, there's more. The next slide. Ooh, what if you so, wanted to find supplies? Huh. This is on our website where you will find our makerspace collection. Uh, and so we, and this is growing all the time. So around the workshops that we've done for the elementary schools we're working with already, we've started to um, put these collections together. And so if you go into cardboard construction as an example, then you will find books that we like that are related to making with cardboard. I'm taking this book to uh, San Fernando and Carmen's already translated this into Spanish for us too. Uh, ways to work with cardboard. This is critical too, just helping students understand the different ways that you can connect and uh, put cardboard together. Here's Kane's Arcade. Again, go and watch this. If you haven't seen this, watch both videos, amazing. And lots of other resources associated with cardboard making, and this will be a growing collection. Um, you then, know what we need to add to that is what? we need to add to the, the Edison robot challenge of the balloons on Broadway. Yeah, balloons over Broadway. Well, that's in here on the Edison well, side, okay, but it could fit in go. both. It could fit oh, in both, Sherry. Okay. I see what you're all saying. Right. This <laughs> is Sherry's collection for Edison robots, all kinds of uh, different things. The books that we like, House of Robots, how to 3D print one of those skids if you want to. Lots and lots of robot books that we have in here. This uh, also will be a growing collection in here in the um, design challenges is where you can find that obstacle course design that we have. And There'll also be more that we'll add in there as well. Um, and then before I open it up and answer some of the questions that you've been asking, the last thing that we've just added right before this started is this uh, Makerspace Getting Started Kits collection. So if you go to this Google folder, then you will find these are the kits that both Oyama and Warren purchased in order to get started. And so if you buy all 10 of them, it's about $6,000. Um, to get started. But again, if you only have $600, then you could just start with the cardboard maker kit, or you could start with the Edison kit. And when possible, I've put links to the um, supplies that are listed there so that you'll know where to get them. Um, and uh, there's other things in here. Turing tumbles are amazing. We have some teacher leaders that really adore them. I see Spia is shaking her head. Um, but this is a good place to start. And if you want some advice or if, if you have a certain amount of money and you'd like to know what our advice would be in terms of maximizing it and you want to focus on circuits or something, then reach out. We're always happy to help. We do have just a few minutes left. Um, I saw some questions in the chat. Most of the books are definitely in our collection. I, maybe Aaron Slater isn't on there yet because it's pretty new, but almost all those are in there. Other questions, then feel free to unmute if you would like. But I guess uh, my advice too is just get started. And oh, somebody did ask if there's a, a way for teachers to um, sign up for the makerspace. Yes, yeah, so both Oyama and Warren have a calendar system where teachers can sign up and reserve that space. And also just in terms of developing the culture of the school, you know, both Oyama and Warren elementaries have awesome principals who are really bringing that maker culture to their school. And it's just um, expected that teachers, and the teachers are excited about it, right? But like, it's expected that this will not just be a niche thing that a few students get to have access to, which is not fair. Uh, it absolutely is meant to be uh, a space that will be utilized by all students at all levels multiple times a year. That is the vision for these maker spaces because that is the way that it should be. And it shouldn't always just be after school clubs, although Sherry is now helping the principal at Oyama with the after school robotics club because she just can't help herself. She loves robots so much. Um, but anyway, that, I mean, for us, that has to be also a part of the vision at the school that it's not a niche space that just one or two teachers use 
and it's not being fully utilized by all students. The idea is that it's it's being built and used by all students at all grade levels multiple times a year as it should be. Other questions, comments? How did we do? Wasn't this a great tour of makerspaces? Like, yay, right? And I'm telling you that makerspace in the mall is just that, we love Catalyst and anytime we can have an excuse to go over there. And I will say, you know, if I have a workshop on the weekend and I'm utilizing our own building here that the county owns, we have to, you know, our programs get charged for heating and cooling. So we have to pay a fee. And I'm like, heck with that, then I'm going over to Catalyst because it's so beautiful. And the other advantage of Catalyst at the mall is the parking. You just come in, it's a massive parking lot. You just come in, you park, no problem. You wander in. People at lunchtime go down to the food court, come back with bags. They've been shopping a little bit. I will say we always give an hour lunch when we're there because people really, they go, oh, no. and it's great for them coming back after lunch. They've had a break. They did a little shopping. Now they're back and they're ready to focus and get some stuff done. So we have really enjoyed that partnership and any excuse we have to use that beautiful space, we get over there and do it. Gorgeous. It was awesome. It was just awesome. That's all I have to say. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, Ruth, and we look forward to seeing you over there and seeing what you do wind up doing with all those students over there. So keep us posted. Uh, I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's great. As it should be. Well, then mission accomplished. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, Vicki, I couldn't agree more. I will tell you too, just in terms of equity, you know, it's very frustrating. Uh, that not everybody has access, not all of our students have access to this kind of creative, awesome engagement and thinking. And I will say all the schools that we're working with are Title I schools that are definitely engaging students that also deserve to have these really amazing, awesome experiences. And quite honestly, they have solutions stuck in their heads that we desperately need to unlock. And this is the way to start doing that. So I couldn't agree more. And um, I think that is also a good way to try to um, secure funding is by making that case because it's very valid and, and important. So um, anything we can do to help you, just let us know. Anything else? Marty, All right, well, Marty Doug just- there? Yeah, Marty just put the STEM cadre register for the next event is on the 19th of April. Um, do we know yet if that might be hybrid or? Uh, Phil is still on the call. So Phil, if you wanna answer that, you can, or you can just pop into the chat if you're not sure yet, if it's gonna be hybrid. No, I'm not planning for it to be hybrid at this point, but we're gonna yeah. do <laughs> kind of what we did here today. Yeah, I don't, I don't blame you at all. And Phil, do you want to tell us a little bit of, give it, give us a little teaser? What are we going to, what are we going to get to experience and see? Well, uh, you're going to get to see a very unique program in the Crest program that very few other high schools have anything like it. It's a, um, a, a career and technical education STEM academy that teaches three different strands of study, bioscience, engineering, and computer science. But I also want to uh, talk about what we're doing as a district K-12 in STEM and, and really some of the challenges with declining enrollment, loss of teachers, and uh, kind of how we're, uh, well, how we're changing, which, I, which we haven't really completely decided yet, but those will be kind of things. But I want to talk about how you can start a STEM academy at a high school and some of the lessons that we've learned from from doing this fantastic that sounds great and uh we look forward to hearing from you and uh i'm also interested in the i'm, I'm gonna challenge you a bit i think we need it to be pre-k through 12. we're champions for the pre-k teachers too phil so <laughs> oh i'm 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 a big believer of that and uh that and, and which will be my frustration for how things go in this district but so it's, it's a very different um, look, looking at a public school and, you know, or a public district and, and how it's trying to tackle STEM and STEAM. And um, so I, I won't be quite as uh, enthusiastic and entertaining as you guys were, but I'll show you what, what we're doing here and 
try and do a, a good description of what's going on in the rest of the schools. Oh. No, that's awesome. We're looking forward to it. Don't believe him. He's going to be entertaining as all get out. Are you kidding? This is going to be great. And by the way, he has bucked the trends in the system. Uh, Crest Academy has increased enrollment while many other STEM and STEAM uh, academies are decreasing. So never fear. You're going to learn a lot at our next STEM Leadership Cadre Showcase. So thanks, Bill, for popping on and, and letting us know a little bit about what's in store for April 19th. Um, Danelle, uh, yeah, I'll let you close this out. This has just yeah. been wonderful. The, the last thing I would say is please just share this opportunity with others that you know. So if you're not a high school teacher, share it with high school teachers and principals and that. And it's not just for high school folks. You'll also get something out of that hearing what's going on and just those ideas of knowing what's happening around our state and being able to say when somebody says, well, that's not possible and you can go but it is, and I know where it's happening, and I know the people to connect you with to tell you how they did it. So that's our hope, and we look forward to seeing you all back here with a couple of buddies uh, next, um, uh, next month in April. So thank you, thank you for your time. Please continue to be safe and healthy and take care of yourselves so that you can do the best for our students as well. Bye, everyone.